So I'm going to talk a little bit about some f a foundational principle, uh, which we are all aware of. It is a foundational principle for you and I as believers. I'm going to talk about faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The Bible describes faith as substance and evidence. Faith is not wishful thinking. It is not I wish or I hope. Uh, it is I know. It is substance and evidence. So your faith has a tangible value in the spiritual realm. You may not see it in the natural, but there is a tangibility to your faith. Another translation says it like this. It says, now faith is the title deed of the things hoped for and the proof of things which are not being seen. It is the title deed. If you purchase a house, you will get a title deed with your name on it. You know, sometimes you purchase the house. The house is not yet built. The land is empty. You don't see it in the natural you can't feel it in the natural, but you have the title deed. So you're, someone could go to the land and say, hey, you don't have a house, man. There is nothing there. You know, you're, you're wasting your time. You've wasted your money, but you have got the title deed. And the title, it's not just the title deed. It, said, it is the proof of the things which are not being seen. So your faith, for the things of God, for the promises of God for your life is the title deed and it is the proof of those things. You've not yet seen it. You've not yet seen it in the natural, but you know that it is yours. I've got that proof and that proof is your faith. Amen? And as Christians, we have a mental understanding of this. Uh, we know that faith is the foundation of our Christian lives. We know that without faith, it is impossible to please God. We know we are supposed to, as the scriptures say, live by faith and not by sight. We know that the just shall live by faith. That is direction from God to us as believers. So faith is the foundation of our Christian walk. Yet faith is also the biggest challenge of our Christian walk. Believing and standing on blessed assurance, not based on what we see or feel in the natural, purely based on the word of God and the integrity of his character is a challenge because we live in a body with five senses. And we are supposed to live by this sixth sense called faith. Regardless of what our five senses tell us, the scripture says we are supposed to walk by faith, not by sight. Sight is one of the five senses, but we are supposed to walk by faith. We don't know how it's going to happen, but we trust God's promise to make it happen. We don't see it happening, but we know that it is happening. We don't feel it happening, but we know that it is happening. We don't have all the details, but we trust in the character of God, that God is working all things out. And speaking of details, you know, I spoke at a missions conference uh, recently, and I shared about how God is not big on revealing details. How many of you know that? You know, it's easy to have faith if we know all the details. We like the details and understand the importance of knowing the details before we are asked to do something. But I don't know about you, but I like to have all the details up front. Details to me are very, very important. And it frustrates me when people tell me to do something or give me generic information on something without details. It just makes things so much harder. You know, sometimes I'll ask Pastor Debbie, I said, Debs, where's the receipt or where's the keys? And she will say, it's in my handbag. <laughs> how many of you know that, how many of you men know <laughs> that that information is of no use to a man? 
We can do nothing with that information. It's in my handbag. Have you tried looking for something in a woman's handbag? There are compartments and, and layers of things from, from, from different periods of time, you know, from, from the Triassic and the Jurassic and, and the Cretaceous period. And I'm going to need some serious archaeological skills to find something in her handbag. True. Amen. Said the guy who just got a girlfriend. So, so, who said that? Oh, Stephen. Uh. <laughs> Mary, no, he doesn't have a girlfriend, Mary. He's been faithfully married to you for years. I thought it was Robin. Because, you know, Robin just sticks out. Uh, every time you hear a voice, you look there and Robin is. Why you laughed when I said you got a girl, just got a girlfriend? Okay, no kidding. So I need a lot more details. I need, I need specifics. Tell me it's in your handbag. Where in your handbag can you be more specific? I want her to tell me, to give me directions like this. It's, it's, it's right there. Look in my bag. You move the bag of chips <laughs> beside the three apples <laughs> under the plunger next to that sunglasses that you lost in 1983. <laughs> Beside that, you will see last year's Christmas shopping list. <laughs> Attached to that is the receipt you're looking for. You know, I need information like that. <laughs> Specific. I, that's how I like my questions answered. And I guess uh, most of us are like that. We want the details because the details saves us time, makes things so much easier, helps reduce unnecessary stress. But part of why the Christian life or the Christian faith is a challenge is because God is not big on giving details. God is big on giving the, the he's great on giving the big picture. When he calls Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Beautiful, beautiful, big picture. He wants you to leave this place. You're going to be blessed beyond your imagination. But if you notice, not much details. Leave this place to a land that you, you will show me? Like, like where? Like which, which direction uh, do I walk in? He doesn't tell Abraham about the, the battles that he would face on the way, the famine in the land that he would face, the challenges that him and his people were going to have to face and the battles that he would have to fight. He doesn't give the details, which is part of the big picture, but God doesn't think that it's important at that point of calling him. When he called the children of Israel, or he called Moses, he says to Moses, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. He tells the children of Israel, beautiful picture. He's leading them out of Egypt into the promised land, flowing with milk and honey. And that's great. Who, who wouldn't want to do that? I mean, I've been 400 years, generations of us suffering under slavery. Sign me up for that trip, God. Sign me up. But in hindsight, you'll notice that some details were missing. There's no mention about the 40 plus, another 40 years roaming around the wilderness. There's no mention about the battles, the food that they will have to eat, how they're going to get water. So there's that, and then there's that point of leading the people out of Egypt. Moses is like, great, here we go. Just like God said, we are being released. We are being freed from over 400 years of slavery. Now they are on their way out and all of a sudden, huge red sea in front of them. What is this sea doing here? How do we get hundreds of thousands of men, women, children, cattle, luggage 
on the other side of this. You see, God didn't say, I'm going to lead you out of Egypt and on your way out, there's going to be a huge sea on your path. So prepare some canoes on the way so that you all can cross that Red Sea. Did God forget about this huge obstacle? I'm sure some of them thought about it. I'm sure it went through Moses' mind. And all of a sudden, they see dust rising in the distance behind them. And there's Pharaoh, who have just suddenly had a change of heart about letting them go. And he's coming with the most powerful army on the earth at that point of time to capture them and take them back into slavery. And the people go into a total meltdown because there's the, there's the sea before them and there's this army behind them. God, why is there a sea in our way of seeing your promise fulfilled? You didn't tell us about this. Why is there this obstacle standing in our path preventing us from stepping into the promise that you have made to us? Making it impossible for us to cross over to where you want us to be. And you know, some of them at that point probably thought God is in heaven going, Oh my goodness, I forgot about the sea here. I should have checked the map before telling them to go in this direction. What do I do now? Who put this sea here? Holy Spirit, what were you thinking? And there will be many Red Sea moments as we journey through life. Those, God, where are you? How am I going to get through this kind of moments where it's a dead end before you? It looks like it's dead. It looks like it's impossible. It looks like you're never going to see the promise of God fulfilled. It looks like it's, you're never going to see that miracle that you've been believing for. But here's the truth. God didn't tell them about the Red Sea in the way, not because it wasn't considered. Just because He doesn't reveal the details, it doesn't mean that God is not into the details. This is the God who, who numbers the very hair on your head. And you think he didn't consider the details of your journey? The Red Sea wasn't there as a hindrance. But it was there as an opportunity for them to encounter God's glory over their life. For them to learn to be a people who lived and operated by faith in God, in the God who was with them on their journey. That God is faithful to His word and promises for their lives regardless of what obstacles stood in their way. Your challenges are not there to keep you from God's promises. It is not that God didn't see the problem that you are facing when He called you, when He spoke to you about your future, when He promised you that you and your household will be saved, when He said that He will make you the head and not the tail, when He said that He's going to bless you, that your generations will be blessed. He said He's going to provide for your needs according to His riches in, in glory in Christ Jesus. He wasn't blind to the challenges that you were going to face when He gave gave those precious promises to you. He saw the negative diagnosis that you would receive. He saw the opposition from the family that you are going through right now. He knew your company was going to retrench you. He saw how your bank balance was going to shock you or freak you out. He saw how people were going to come against you. He saw how the relationship was going to end. He saw the persecution that you were going to endure. These were all in the details that he knew about, that he saw, but he didn't reveal to you because they were not going to stop his faithfulness for your lives. All these are just brush strokes that are going to add up to that big picture that God is painting for your life. You know, when you go up close to a painting, and you look at only a small portion of it, you will just see a, a messy brush stroke. Or when you watch someone painting, or when you watch Suzanne do her art. How many of you watch Suzanne do her art on, on Instagram? When she starts, it looks like a total mess. She's just throwing globs of paint on a canvas. And if 
someone didn't know the artist, they would think, oh my gosh, what is this woman doing? It's terrible. But then, as they wait, as they trust the process, the hands of Suzanne starts to work and all of a sudden that, that glob of paint spots all over, turns into this beautiful artwork. You see, we panic when we don't know the heart of the artist. We see a mess now, you start to panic. What is God doing? Why is this happening to me? But if you trust this God who is faithful, if you trust the process, if you trust the God of the process, you will see that He will finish the good works that He began in you. He has a plan for your life and He makes all things beautiful in its time. Come on, give Jesus a clap offering. He knew it all. Your challenges may be a surprise to you, but it is not a surprise to God. He knew it all. He, saw, he knows the end from the beginning. Every detail about your life, He knew when He gave you those promises. These challenges are not keeping you from the promise. It is developing in you the faith and perseverance you will need to see the promise fulfilled for your life. You see, God is more concerned about building your faith than He is about keeping you comfortable. Because everything that He has for you, because everything that you will need to have victory in life, you're going to lay hold by faith. It's going to be a fight of faith. First John chapter 5, verse 4, it said, Whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Jesus' most used rebuke against his disciples was ye of little faith. That is what frustrated him the most. Many times, their lack of faith and trust in God. Jesus once told them, let's go to the other side. And that was his word for them. We're going to cross over. They get into the boat. They start paddling and then a storm hits. And the storm was so ferocious that it seemed like they were going to drown. And then they start to panic. And in Mark 4 verse 38, it says he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and saying, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose. He rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? He ties in their fear to their lack of faith. Jesus told them, he gave them his word, we are going to go to the other side. He, that was the, the word, Jesus' word for them for their immediate future. This is where we are going. But Jesus doesn't tell them about the storm between here and there. He didn't give them the details of the journey. In fact, if he gave them the details, they would have known about the storm and they most probably would have decided to avoid the journey altogether. So he leaves those details out. And if he left out the details about the storm, it meant, it simply means that the storm wasn't going to stop his word from being fulfilled for their lives. Today you may be facing a storm that you never expected. If God didn't warn you about these things, if He didn't lead you away from it, it just means that these things, these problems, these challenges, these storms are not going to stop His Word from being fulfilled for your life in your life. You know, sometimes God intentionally leaves out certain details for our own good because He knows us too well. Imagine if he told the Israelites, I'm going to deliver you out of slavery in Egypt. Yay! Okay, you guys pretend to be the Israelites and I'll pretend to be Moses. <laughs> I'm going to deliver you from over 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Yay! I'm going to take you to a land that will be your own flowing with milk and honey. 
Some of you diabetics and lactose intolerant people shouldn't have been very excited about the milk and honey. Eh? You're going to be free. You are going to have your own land. And you're going to spend 40 plus 40 years journeying to that land, 80 years. And you're going to be fed the same food every day. But it's going to fall from heaven in the morning. And you can make chapati with it. Every day, chapati, 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 chapati. Are we ready to go? Now you know why God didn't tell him that. Now you know why God doesn't reveal details to you. If God gave all those details to Moses, they would have told, never mind Moses, you and Aaron go. Send, I mean, the, the whip is not so bad. Like, see, we are used to it. Our back's all okay. Very hard already. It's fine. You all go, just send us a postcard. <laughs> we'll just hang around Egypt. See, if God gave them all the details, they would have never left Egypt. They would have never seen his faithfulness. They would have never become a great nation. If we knew all the details, there are parts that we would never walk. Parts that would lead us to our destiny that we would never take. If we had all the details, faith in God becomes unnecessary because we have information we don't need trust. And faith is the key. The disciples knew this. So the disciples asked Jesus once, he says, in Luke chapter 17, verse 5, the apostles said to the Lord, show us how to increase our faith. The Lord answered, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, may you be uprooted and thrown into the sea and it will obey you. You see, they saw Jesus do many miracles. They knew that faith was the key. So they asked Jesus, help me, help us. Lord, to increase our faith. And, and Jesus didn't touch them and say, faith increase in my name. He says this, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be removed and it will be removed. Why does he respond that way to a question on how to increase your faith? He says, if you have small faith, faith like a mustard seed, he uses the, the smallest faith denomination. The smallest one. So it's like all of us are given, the scripture says we all have been given a measure of faith. God gives us all a measure of faith. And Jesus uses the smallest denominator. He said if you have the smallest one, the faith as small as a mustard seed, that is your faith startup pack. We all have a faith startup pack. But if your startup pack is only the smallest faith, you can say, you can to this, to this tree be removed and it shall be removed. Faith as small as a mustard seed. Right? And he says, if you have that faith, like we all have a measure of faith, you could. You could say. He doesn't say, you will say. You could because there is an element of choice. I could do a lot of things with the faith that I have been given. No matter how small it is, I can do something with that faith. But it doesn't mean that I will do it. Everyone who has this seed of faith, what he's saying is you can operate in faith, but not everyone will. So even if your faith is as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this tree, he's saying, even your small faith can be exercised to bring about supernatural results for your life. They wanted to know how to increase their faith. And Jesus basically says to them, you have it. Start exercising your faith. 
use it, believe it, speak it, and you will see the fruits of faith manifest in your life. That is how your faith increases by making a conscious decision to exercise it. You see, faith is a muscle, uh, a spiritual muscle. And like our natural muscle, you can fast and pray. You can sit outside the gym and pray every day, every night, 24 hours. You know, your muscles will not increase. It will not increase by you wishing it or praying it to increase. It increases by you exercising and feeding it. And we all have been given a measure of muscles, right? If you don't have muscle, you won't be able to move, okay? You all have been given a measure of muscles like we have been given a measure of faith. So to the person with a measure of muscles, the difference between the bodybuilder and you is that the bodybuilder exercised that little muscle that he had. He pushed, he stretched, uh, he feeds in a certain way. He lives in his life in such a way that it grows and develops his muscle. He consumes things that helps to grow and develop his muscle. And if faith is like a muscle, we must start living our lives in a way that feed and build our faith. What are we consuming are the things that we are consuming. Listen, you cannot drink Coke every day and expect your muscles to grow. You need to feed your muscles with protein shakes or whatever uh, the necessary food that you will need to build your muscles. Most of us, in, uh, with our faith muscle, we feed ourselves with fear. We feed ourselves with compromise, we feed ourselves with McDonald's, and, <laughs> and then we wonder why our faith is not growing. Yeah. You need to exercise your faith. Faith is like a muscle. We must start living our lives in a way that builds our faith. And what Jesus reveals here is this. He says, you can if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can, choice, your choice, it says you can say to this tree, some others, in another scripture, it says you can say to your mountain, part of the way you increase your faith is by speaking in faith. You have the capacity to speak a certain language of faith that will change circumstances for you. The scripture says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Listen, faith has a language. And because we all have been given a measure of faith, we all have the ability to speak the language of faith. You know, when my son uh, Ethan, my eldest boy, we sent him to a Chinese school for the first three years of his uh, studies. Three years in the Chinese school, and he mastered the Mandarin language. Within a few months, within six months of attending Chinese school, he was able to communicate fluently with his friends, his teachers in Mandarin. You know, I know people, me being one of them, who attended months of Mandarin classes <laughs> at a language center or with a tuition teacher, just to learn an extra language and still cannot communicate to save my life. <laughs> but the difference is this. When you attend a language class, you only speak it when you are at that class. Maybe one hour a week. And then when you leave the class, you're back to your comfortable language zone with all your friends, everybody speaking the, the, the mother tongue. You know, you're back to, yenna day, roti chanai la, this la, that la, that, that kind of thing, right? All your communication is done in this language that you're already comfortable with and you speak in. With the, the, you speak in the language that all the people you hang out with speak, the language that they are all comfortable with you speaking as well. But in the Chinese school, the kids are forced to speak Mandarin, not just in a class, but at every class. You want something from the teacher? Ask in Mandarin. You want something from the canteen? You got to speak in Mandarin. You want to go to the toilet? 
you need to ask in Mandarin. You want to learn anything, you need to understand Mandarin. They are in that environment for at least seven hours a day where only one language works. The only language that's going to get you what you want is Mandarin. Faith is a language. The problem is, many of us only speak it maybe an hour or so a week. Maybe in church on a Sunday, or maybe when we pray, or maybe when we are in a certain crisis or in certain settings, but when we leave that space, we go back to the language that we are comfortable with, the language that the people all around us are comfortable with. We start going back to the language of, of, of fear, of uncertainty, the language of, of compromise. So we have moments of faith, but we live in a culture of fear, doubt, and compromise. It needs to be reversed. We can all have moments of fear, but we need to cultivate and live in a culture of faith. Faith should be the default language of the believer. Because like that Chinese school, the only language that works in the kingdom of God, the only language that is going to get you what you desire, the only language through which you are going to see the promises of God fulfilled for your life, the only language through which you're going to call for things that are not as though they are, the only language through which you're going to get that breakthrough is the language of faith. Romans chapter 1 verse 17, that famous scripture, it is written, the just shall live by faith. Not the just shall have an hour of faith at church. A few days a week, a few days a week of faith, the just shall live by faith. Faith is the lifestyle of the just, those who have been justified in Christ. Faith is the lifestyle of the believer. Going back to Moses and the Red Sea. God comes to rescue them. Uh, he sends the 10 plagues. The people get out of Egypt. They've just seen miracles upon miracles. God do so many great things before their very eyes. The power of God. They've just seen God deliver them supernaturally. Like nothing they've ever seen before. And then all of a sudden now they are in front of a Red Sea, a huge obstacle in their way. The language that they use at this point makes all the difference. The children of Israel, those who have just seen God do so much, God just delivered them out of 400 years of slavery. And this is what they say when they come to this first major obstacle. In Exodus 14 verse 11, he says, they say, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than for us to die in the wilderness. They were in a crisis. Nothing like a crisis to reveal the faith culture that you have. What's in your heart? It overflows. And they showed what was in their heart. They said, didn't we tell you that we were better off in Egypt? No, you didn't. Actually, you were crying out to God because your slavery was too much to bear. But they were in fear and just like Faith has a language. Fear too has a language. And it is the language of victimhood. It is the language of defeat. It is the language of hopelessness and blame and compromise. Moses in turn says, Do not be afraid. Stand still 
and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to hold your peace. Now sometimes faith just means you holding your peace in a time of turmoil. So Moses has a different language. But you must understand, at the point of declaring those things, Moses had no idea as to how God was going to get them out, going to get them across the sea. He had no idea how God was going to handle this problem. He had the big picture. He knew God was going to get us out of slavery in Egypt, but no details as to how he was going to handle this, this huge problem in the way. He didn't know. He didn't know what God was going to do. But he knew that he who promised is faithful. And what he says will come to pass. So Moses doesn't speak based on what he sees naturally. He speaks based on his confidence in God's character and his promise. God said he's going to deliver us. He's going to deliver us. Now there's a Red Sea in the way. But the Red Sea doesn't change the promise of God for us. And more importantly, the Red Sea doesn't change Moses' speech, his language. He speaks the language of faith. He speaks and declares based on the promise, not based on the problem. And that's how you and I need to speak and make declarations over our lives, our family, our future, from our confidence in God's character and His promise and His power. Faith believes the promise. Faith sees the impossible. Faith speaks it forth. Faith is the language of the kingdom. Romans 4.17 says, God who gives life to the dead, He calls those things which are, do, not, do not exist as though they did. Faith calls those things that are not there, that you don't see in the natural as though they are. Moses didn't see the deliverance at that point, but he calls it forth. He declares it based on the faithfulness of God. Today, maybe you see the problem. Don't declare the power of the problem. Declare the power of the promise. It may look impossible in the natural. There may seem like there is no way through naturally. It may seem like things are not going to change naturally. But if you have faith as small as that of a mustard seed, you can say to this tree, be uprooted. It will be done for you. The language of faith declares breakthrough in the midst of a challenge. The language of faith declares restoration in the midst of loss. The language of faith declares a season of blessing coming in the midst of a season of challenge. The language of faith speaks, speaks life into death, speaks light into darkness, speaks hope into hopelessness. That is the language of faith and that is how you and I, people of the kingdom, are meant to speak. We are called those who live by faith and not by sight. You know, your words have got power. Job chapter 22 verse 28 says, You will declare a thing and it will be established for you. Isaiah 57 verse 19, God says, I create the fruit of the lips. The scripture says your words produce fruit. Your words have got creative power. It's interesting to note, the first use of language or speech as recorded in the Bible was not to communicate, it was to create. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, it says the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters and the Lord God said, let there be light and there was light. And according to the law first mentioned, the primary use of speech is to create. The scripture says you will decree a thing and it will be established for you. God spoke into the darkness and he brought forth light. He spoke into the barrenness and he brought forth life. We need to start speaking the reality of God's word into our lives, into our circumstances. 
Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 37, the Spirit of God leads him, takes him up and uh, in a vision and leads him to a valley of dry bones. Into a valley, speaks already of a, a bad situation, a deep situation. And the valley was filled with dry bones, not just dead people, dry bones. No life at all. No meat attached to it, just dead bones. And the Lord speaks to Ezekiel and he says, Son of man, can these bones live? Basically asking, can this situation change? Can this hopeless situation transform and change? Can this dead situation come to life? And Ezekiel's response was typical. Lord, you know. You know. God knows. La. God knows la, if my healing will come. God knows la, if my family situation is ever going to change. God knows la, if this relationship is going to heal. God knows la, if I'm ever going to get a job or a good job. God knows la, if I'm ever going to come out of this bankruptcy. God knows. That is our typical response. It sounds holy, but it's faithless talk. And God says to Ezekiel, He said, He says, prophesy to these bones. You speak to these bones. Now I want you to think about this. God was there. God was standing with Ezekiel looking at that hopeless situation. God could have done this. Many of us think this is how God works, right? Ezekiel, watch me. You tell me what to do, I will do. God could have done that. Watch me. Bones live and the bones would have come to life. But God wanted Ezekiel. God knew he had power. Ezekiel knew God had power. But God wanted Ezekiel to know that God's word in his mouth is still God's word. It still carries the same authority, the same power. So he looks to Ezekiel. He says, you prophesy to these bones. Say to these bones, this is what the word of the Lord says. Some of us are looking at dry bones, so to speak. Hopeless situations ahead of you. It seems like it's impossible. It seems like it's dead. It seems like it's a dead end. It seems like this will never change. This will never heal. There will never be restoration. It is impossible in the natural. And we are looking to God. God do something. God do something. But God is saying to you this morning, listen, you speak into that situation. You prophesy into that marriage. You prophesy into your finances. You prophesy into your family. You prophesy over your children's life. Say to them, this is what the word of the Lord says because God's word in your mouth is still God's word. Amen. His words have got power. We need to start prophesying into our situation. Don't, don't echo what the enemy is saying when David faced a giant. A huge obstacle before him. He looks at the giant. Naturally, the giant was more powerful. Naturally, the giant's weapons were more powerful. Naturally, the, the weapons that he carried, the armor that he wore, everything. There was nothing about the giant before him that, would, that he would look at and say, easy la kacang kutir this way. Not a problem. He was stronger, he was bigger, he was a more skilled warrior. And on top of that, this problem, this giant was saying to David, Am I a dog that you come before me with a, some sticks and stones? You know, I'm, I'm going to feed your body to the birds of the air. So David at that point, facing this, what in the natural seems like an impossible situation, at that point, he could choose to believe what the giant was saying, what the giant was prophesying over his future, 
Because let me tell you, when you face giants, every giant, every hurdle, every challenge that you face has a voice and it is speaking to you. It is prophesying over your future. It is prophesying into your life. It's prophesying into your family. You're never going to get out of this. You're going to be just like your father. You're going to be just like your mother. You're going to suffer the same way that person suffered. You know, you're going to end up a bankrupt. You see, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to feed your body to the birds of the air. David, instead of believing what the problem was saying, he decides, I'm going to trust in the integrity and character of my God. So even as the giant was prophesying into David's future, David started prophesying into his future and into the giant's future. You are going to come down. I'm going to take your head. You are not going. How dare you speak? The God who delivered me from the bear, the God who delivered me from the lion, that same God is with me in this situation and He is going to give you into my hands. Some of you need to remember the God who delivered you from the bears, the God who delivered you from the lion, the God who saved you, the God who healed you, the God who redeemed you, who rescued you all those years ago. You would have died. It would have been impossible. You would not have made it but for God and that same God is with you as you're facing this challenge, this giant, and the same God who delivered you out of that is going to deliver this into your hands. You need to start prophesying, start prophesying, start prophesying, start prophesying into your situations. Amen? Come on, let's stand.